me pray with you as we begin today. Father, we are thankful, as always, for your love and your grace. Thankful, Father, during these days of difficulty, these days of uncertainty, for the constancy of the gospel, the constancy of your involvement in our lives. We're thankful for your power. We are thankful, Father, for your comfort and care. Uh, we are thankful for this family that you have made us a part of. We pray, Father, that you would bless each moment uh, of our service today. Uh, bless our Calvary Hill families, and again, all of those who are watching along with us today. May your uh, word be held high. May your son uh, be exalted uh, is our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a reason why the darkness runs from light. There's a reason why we stand here now forgiven. Jesus is alive.
this morning. Um, there is nothing that can stop the children of God from celebrating on this day. Absolutely no, nothing, because our hope is alive, and it is not dependent upon the circumstances of this world. How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night and then through the darkness your loving kindness and so through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written cause Jesus Christ is my living could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to where my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken I am forgiven the key
Thank you, guys. That was, that was wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I would encourage you this morning to take your Bibles and turn with me once again to John chapter 16. We're going to conclude our Easter series, Overcome, uh, this morning. We're going to be looking at one verse, John chapter 16, verse 33. Of all of the great days on the Christian calendar, uh, Easter is perhaps the greatest reminder to Christians of God's ability to replace uncertainty uh, with certainty, uh, to overcome our sorrow and replace it with joy. Uh, in the chapters leading up to where we will read this morning, Jesus has been trying to prepare his disciples for what was to come. Uh, he knew uh, that these men that he loved, these men that had become his closest friends, were about to be plunged into the depths of despair. Uh, but he also knew that their despair would soon be transformed into rejoicing. He had told them as much. Uh, he had given them his word. In John 16, 22, he said this. He said, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away. Uh, Jesus was talking about the joy that should characterize the life of those who are in him, those who, like he, have overcome the world. Uh, he tried to help them understand this, but they, they still continued to have difficulty. So now, in this last verse, he tells them why he has said all of these things, uh, in spite of the fact that they were still struggling to grasp uh, his meaning. So let me read this verse to you as we begin this morning. John chapter 16, verse 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus begins this, this verse with a, a purpose statement. Everything that he has said to his disciples leading up to this very moment, and even carrying forward uh, through his betrayal in the garden, his arrest, his, his trial before the high priest, his sentencing, uh, and his crucifixion, the resurrection, the exaltation, all of these things have been said for a purpose. And Jesus here specifically says that the purpose is that in him we might have peace. And so I want to take just a moment to, to remind ourselves of the things that Jesus has said. These are things that should give us today in our current situation peace. Again, in spite of the difficulties that we are all experiencing. In John chapter 13, verse 1, we read of Jesus' love for his disciples. When we consider the love that Jesus has for us, it should give us a sense of, of peace, a sense of, of comfort. Verse 1 of John 13, Jesus, of course, is being spoken of. It says, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. In John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, Jesus had spoken to his disciples of the reality of heaven. And, and not only that, but the place that he himself was going to prepare for them there. He said, in my father's house are many rooms. <clears throat> if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. In John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus told the disciples that while they awaited his return, they would be involved in fruitful, <clears throat> satisfying work. Truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. 
The next couple of verses in John 14, Jesus assures his disciples that as they call out to him in pursuit of this work that he had given them for assistance and, and guidance, they would receive it. Their prayers would be heard and answered. Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, this will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And then in John chapter 16, verse 13, <clears throat> Jesus promised his disciples even greater help. Uh, the Holy Spirit of God, the helper that he would send. He said, when, the, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. So Jesus had said all of these things and, and more to his disciples so that as they approached these moments preceding his death, <clears throat> as they witnessed uh, all of the suffering that he would endure, and then as they rejoiced together on that first Easter Sunday morning, they would indeed remember the things that he had said and have peace. And just as he said all of these things to his disciples 2,000 years ago, he says the same things to us too. We can live in this world in spite of all of the difficulty, in spite of all of the confusion, in spite of all of the violence, in spite of all of the sickness and disease and death, we can live in this world with peace, uh, peace in our hearts. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. When Jesus speaks of the peace that we have in him, he is not speaking of something that, that they would have, uh, nor is he speaking of something that we one day will have, but he is speaking of a very present possession. Those of us who are in Christ, we have peace uh, right now. It is ours to claim. Jesus had already spoken of this peace in John chapter 14, verse 27, where he said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. In other words, Jesus was speaking of a, a sense of well-being. Uh, this word peace, or the Hebrew equivalent shalom, was a word that, that, that the Jews were intimately familiar with. Uh, it was the desire that they would live their lives with this peace. Uh, and Jesus assures his disciples, he assures us today that that peace is ours in him. And there's a, a couple of aspects of this peace that I want to share with you this morning. First of all, there is a peace with God. To be in Christ uh, is the New Testament equivalent of being saved. Uh, Paul writes to his fellow believers in Ephesians chapter 1, and he says this, God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He writes, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. In him we have redemption through his blood. In him we have obtained an inheritance. In him you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Jesus said, in me, in Christ you have peace, this peace with God that accompanies uh, our salvation. But not only peace with God, I, I believe the peace that Jesus was speaking of here specifically was the peace of God. Uh, the disciples were about to go through a tremendously trying few days, uh, days that would, as we mentioned last week, put their faith uh, to the test. Uh, and, and so he says that not only as believers do we have peace with God, but he's also promising here the peace of God. He, he speaks of that sense of wholeness, that sense of satisfaction in life that comes as a result of a, of a conscious and shared dependence upon and trust in Jesus. Again, this is a peace that we come to know and, and that we come to understand more fully with each passing day as members of the body of Christ, as members of his church. Again, we are reminded through the teaching and preaching of God's word of all that Christ has done for us, of all that God has done for us throughout history. Again, it's, a, it's, this, it's this consciousness 
of the greatness of our God, of, of who He is, who He has revealed Himself to be. And, and not only that, but it is a shared dependence upon Him, a shared trust in Him. I, I want to emphasize that this morning. We're not able to gather together and to share in this worship service as we would normally do, but this peace of God that comes to us or that resides with us in the midst of suffering and sorrow is a peace that, that, that we really come to understand and, and grasp completely as a result of our, of our togetherness, uh, of sharing one another's needs, of praying for one another, of serving one another, of loving one another. That's where this peace of God comes from. It, it speaks of an effort on our part uh, to draw close to God. As, as, as James says in his epistle, James 4.8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Peter picks up on this same idea uh, and, and he says, therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Uh, church, these are words for us. Words that will give us peace, strength, comfort, contentment, satisfaction, no matter what we may have to endure in this world. And let me just say this as well. Uh, Jesus, of course, wants us to understand that this peace is ours because he understood something that I think sometimes we fail to understand, at least to understand as we should. And, and, and he says it right here. He makes it absolutely clear. And it's not only here that you find this thought. He says very plainly, in the world, you will have tribulation. As Christians, we live a life of perpetual peril. Uh, Jesus speaks of the certainty of trouble, the certainty of sorrow, the certainty of persecution by the world. Earlier in John chapter 15, he had warned his disciples saying, you are not of this world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Jesus was not caught off guard by what was about to take place. God has not been caught off guard by what we are going through for these past couple of months with the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, this is all a part of living in the world, as Jesus mentions it here, the world in which we will have tribulation. That, that word world here speaks of that organized system led by Satan throughout the Gospel of John. Satan is referred to as the ruler of this world. So there is an, an organized system led by Satan, the ruler of this world, that stands in opposition to God, stands in opposition to God's people, in opposition to God's purposes. Jesus sought to make that exceptionally clear to his disciples. In this world you will have tribulation. And again, the word tribulation, which we're all familiar with, speaks of trouble, hardship, suffering that comes as a result from following Jesus. Now we all know that there is trouble that comes to every human soul, right? This world is a world of trouble. This world is a world of, of sorrow. But Jesus here speaks specifically of the tribulation that would come to those who sought to follow him, who sought to fulfill the purposes and plans of God in their own lives, who sought to carry the message of the gospel into all the world. There would be a, a specific kind of trouble, suffering that would come to those who would follow Jesus. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Uh, we cannot look at our present circumstances uh, as something that shouldn't be happening to us. Uh, certainly it's something that we would prefer not happen to us, but throughout history, as long as man has walked upon the earth, as long as men and women have chosen to follow God, there has been trouble, sorrow, persecution, heartache, tragedy. Uh, it's common to life in general and to life specifically of those who follow 
Jesus. The expectation of suffering led Paul to write, or pardon me, Peter to write in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 3. He said, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. The idea here, of course, is that we will suffer again. It's clearly declared Christians will suffer tribulation because we are in this world. We suffer, but we are to suffer as Jesus did. And, and by that I mean a couple of things. Number one, we, we suffer confidently. Confidently because we know that God is sovereign. We know that God is upon his throne. Again, we know that God is more powerful than any virus. He is more powerful than any enemy that could ever come against us. He is, he is guiding and directing and bringing about all of his plans and purposes. Everyone will be fulfilled in exactly the way that he has determined, that he has decreed. So we suffer, but we suffer with confidence. God is in Control, And not only do we suffer with confidence, but we can suffer contentedly. Again, uh, there should be a, a sense of joy that characterizes us, even in the midst of a, of a coronavirus pandemic. A happiness, a joy. We suffer confidently because we know that even in our suffering, God, as we have already talked about, has promised to work all things together for our good. Even this. And, of course, we know that he's always at work bringing about glory to himself. Uh, we will suffer, no question about it, Christian. But we suffer with confidence. God is in control. We suffer with contentedness. Uh, God will work all these things together for our good. And then Jesus makes this last and wonderful statement before he begins his high priestly prayer in chapter 17. He says, in the world you'll have tribulation, but take heart. Take heart. I have overcome the world. It's a, it's a promise, but it's a promise that contains a provocation. Jesus is, is, is provoking us with this promise to live in a certain way. It's similar to the encouragement that he gave his disciples back in John chapter 14 where he, he, he speaks of his home going to the Father, of his return after he had prepared a place for them. Uh, he, he speaks of, uh, of living the life of faith that he has called us to. In other words, living this life with absolute assurance that what Jesus has said to us is true. That's what faith is. Faith is not just grasping with our minds some set of facts, but rather faith is acting upon, living in light of the truth. And that's what Jesus is saying to us here. Take heart. I've overcome the world. Live in light of the fact that I have overcome the world. Now, Jesus is saying all these things, which makes it a, a completely audacious statement. He's saying all things before his betrayal, before his arrest, before his crucifixion, before his burial in that borrowed tomb. He's saying all of these things before that. In the midst of their trial, in the midst of their suffering, Jesus says, take heart. I've overcome the world. How did Jesus overcome the world? The Bible teaches us that Jesus lived a, sinful, a sinless life. It actually says that Jesus was tempted in every way such as we, yet without sin. Jesus has overcome the world through his sinless life. Of course, we know he overcame the world through his death on the cross. He died there bearing our sins. He didn't die for his own sin, but he died there on the cross bearing our sin. He became sin for us, Paul says, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Through his death on the cross, he defeated sin. He took it away. And then, of course, the reason that we celebrate this Easter Sunday morning the resurrection. Three days later, just as the scriptures had foretold, Jesus rose 
from the dead, triumphing over all of our enemies, Satan, sin, death. Uh, he has secured our victory over the world through his death and resurrection. He has secured our victory over the flesh and the devil. Th this, this victory, it's interesting, this, this word overcome is, is a word that implies that though this victory was accomplished for us 2,000 years ago, it continues right up to this very moment. Are you walking this morning in the victory that Christ secured for you on the cross of Calvary? Because Jesus has has taken on our enemies. He, is, he has gone to war, so to speak. He has, he has battled and, and won. He has conquered. He has, he has triumphed. Because of that, he can say to us this morning, take heart. Cheer up. Be strong. Be courageous. I've battled the world. I've battled the ruler of the world. And I've won. That's what Jesus says to us on this Easter Sunday morning. That's what he says to us every Sunday morning, every day of our lives. So church, walk in the peace that you have in Christ. Live in that peace day by day. Understand that in spite of the fact that you and I are in Christ, that, that, that we are saved, that we're born again, that we're part of, of the body of Christ, members of God's household, we are still in this world, a world that hates us, <clears throat> a world where we will continue to experience trial, struggle, tribulation. But again, we have this precious promise of Jesus. Take heart, church. Take heart, Christians. Take heart. I have overcome the world. Let me just close this morning with these words from the Apostle Paul that are found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Paul wrote these words of encouragement to comfort those who were already beginning to experience the tribulation of this world. The church was brand new, and yet the battle <clears throat> was being actively waged. And he says this to the church. He says this to us. For God has not destined us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, whether we die or whether we live, that we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So church, that's... That's our comfort this morning. That's our promise on this Easter Sunday morning. Whether we live or whether we die, no matter what this world can throw at us, in Christ we have peace. In Christ we have victory. Let me pray with you. Father, we are so thankful today for your love and your grace. Thankful for your words of encouragement this morning. I thank you, Father, for this Easter Sunday morning. I thank you that though we are not able to gather together as we normally would, uh, we know that you are here in our midst. You are there in each household. You are there at each kitchen table, living room, den. Lord, you are, you are there with your people. And I, I pray, Father, that you would bless and encourage each one I pray now, Father, that you would bless uh, the remainder of our time together today uh, as we observe this ordinance, the Lord's Supper, uh, as a family. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you can see, we have prepared here uh, for us uh, to observe the Lord's Supper uh, together. I hope that you have made some preparation uh, at home. If not, now's your chance. Make a, a run to the kitchen, grab a couple of crackers and some juice, and uh, meet us right back here. Uh, I'm going to do, as I have done so many times on this occasion, I'm going to read uh, from Luke's Gospel, chapter 22. So this is your opportunity uh, to, to make ready if you have not already done so. Luke, chapter 22. 
beginning in verse 7. The Bible says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. And they said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you, uh, that is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. And with those words, Jesus instituted the very ordinance, the very ceremony that we are uh, going to uh, have this morning uh, and to share uh, with all of you. Uh, and as again, I have said so many times over the years, this Lord's Supper uh, is first and foremost a commemoration of our Lord's sacrifice on the cross. The, uh, the bread represents the body that was broken for us. Uh, the juice or the wine represents the blood uh, that was poured out uh, for our atonement. Uh, these are the elements of the Lord's Supper, and I, I hope that you have these uh, with you at this moment. The, the Lord's Supper is also more than simply a commemorative meal. Uh, it's, a, it's a celebration. Uh, Easter is a, is a celebration of the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, as the, the Scriptures had foretold, he, he rose from the dead uh, on the third day. And so we celebrate His life this morning and through this sacrament. The Bible says, on the night when He was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it, and He said... This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So if you have your bread, now is the time to take a bite. And rather than have a song, as we would normally do, between the elements, the serving of the elements, uh, we decided it would be a good idea for us to share personal testimony uh, with you of how these days of uh, COVID-19 uh, have affected us uh, as a staff. And uh, so, Rick's going to begin for us this morning. First of all, I just want to let you know how much we miss you. You know, to see us, your smiling face, your your encouragements that you give us, Lord, they're, they're so, in, so important, Lord. I, I just uh, let you know that uh, we appreciate so much and can't wait to give you hugs again. This church uh, is our church. In Calvary Hill, we love you. I want to say a word to the choir. I miss the choir. I miss meeting and, and singing songs of praise and giving God the glory for every, everything that we do. Lord, I just, uh, I just want you to know that uh, we just miss you so much. The Bible says that Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Let you know that Jesus is still Lord of all. Amen. Of course... As Jesus had distributed the bread, he said to them that uh, I am the true bread of heaven. Uh, anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And then, of course, he went on to say that in the same manner, 
He took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and you, sealed by the shedding of my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus said, this is my blood which is shed for you. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Now Neil's going to share a word with us. Um, on, check, check that. Um, we do miss you guys so much. Um, I know how much I miss refuge. I know how much I, I miss um, gathering together as a family. I know Tyler misses being with the kids. By the way, they just had a baby, and uh, so we're excited for them. That's another thing to praise the Lord about. But I, this week I read a little book by N.T. Wright, just trying to, I knew we were going to do communion today, and so I just wanted to kind of get my, my mind right about what we were doing. And one thing that 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 book kind of hit me with, and, and you, it's times where you know things, but then you it clicks or something grabs a hold of you a little bit differently. Passover was this time where the Jews were looking back at what God did by bringing them out of Egypt. They were looking at the situation they were in, and they were looking forward to God doing this brand new thing by sending his son and, and, and doing this great redemption work. And the disciples are all gathering around that night thinking they're going to have a typical Lord's Supper celebration or, or a Passover celebration. And yet Jesus turns everything to himself in that time. And it was as if Jesus was saying, you know, this thing that you're waiting for is in me. This, this covenant that you've been longing for that Jeremiah and Ezekiel talked about is in me. And... Um, I was reading that and, and how Christ was relating the Passover to himself and, and reshaping it and reforming it. And then I begin to think about what Brother James just said, that this is a time where I'm looking back at what Jesus did on the cross. It's a time where I'm looking right now at the present and what he's doing in my life. And then it's a time where we're looking forward to what he's going to do, just like the Jews did. He's taking all that and he's pointing it to himself. And I think this is the thing that really has hit my heart over um, the this last month as we've been um, sheltering in place and staying away from each other. Um, the whole world is going through this moment where no one, it's like no one knows what's going on and no one really knows exactly what to do. Um, but this hit me this week. This world is going somewhere. God has plans for this world. Communion is... Uh, a moment where we stop and say, wait, wait a minute, because of what Jesus did, we can have peace now, as Brother James just taught, we can have peace now and we can have hope that this world is going somewhere. God has plans for it. And this moment where everything seems to be so crazy and chaotic, communion reminds me that it's not, that, that God has a plan and he's got a plan for my family. He's got a plan Hello, hello, hello. Thanks, pops. Uh, it's just a reminder that he's got plans for my life. He has plans for my family. He has plans for this church, and he has a plan for the church universal and for this entire world. And uh, and so I, I've just been filled with hope this week as we've been thinking about these things and contemplating um, what what this time means and how. Um, this world is going somewhere because of what Amen. Jesus did. Amen. Amen. And of course, Jesus concluded his teaching on the Lord's Supper, uh, emphasizing uh, what it is that he has left us here in the world to do. Uh, he said in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes. So church, our, our wonderful privilege and great responsibility uh, is to live our lives, again, experiencing God's peace, experiencing the joy that comes from knowing, as Neil said, that this world is indeed going somewhere, 
experiencing the wonderful fellowship that Rick has said we miss so desperately because of our inability to gather together. And all of this to say to the world that Jesus is the one sent by God uh, to save us. That's what our lives are to be all about. So let me, let me share just a couple of things that I'm thankful for this morning and what uh, the Lord has put on my, my heart during these days. First of all, I want you to know, and I, and I hope you, you feel this way too, that you are, you are thankful for God's protection. You know, as of today, uh, and I'm sad to say that I can't say what I've been saying over the last couple of weeks, but as of today, we only have one member of our church that has tested positive for the COVID-19 virus. Uh, Joyce Morgan went into the hospital for a totally unrelated thing uh, and was tested. Uh, she is completely asymptomatic, so we praise the Lord for that. She's not suffering any ill effects from this virus, but she has tested positive. Uh, she is a part of this family, so I want you to pray for her. But also know this, uh, because of Joyce's uh, declining health uh, she has not been here in our church for quite some time, so no one has been exposed to the virus as a result of being around her. So uh, just pray for her. I know that uh, she's being isolated in the hospital. Uh, her family is not able to visit her. We are not able to visit her, and it's a really difficult time for her uh, in that regard. But, but nonetheless, I praise the Lord uh, that God has protected us as a, as a church uh, from this virus. Uh, I also... I'm thankful today for the way that God has continued to provide for us as a church. You know, when we don't gather together, when we don't pass the offering plate, uh, there can be a little uncertainty associated with that. Uh, but, uh, you know, God has continued to provide for His church. Uh, and, and let me just say this. As far as I know, none of our church family is suffering without the necessities of life. Uh, we have made a point over these last several weeks uh, to make contact with various members of our church. We've, we're trying to reach out to those who potentially uh, might be in need, who might need some assistance. But, but one phone call after another, one voice after another on the phone uh, lets us know that they're doing fine, that they're being taken care of, that, that they're being ministered to. And, and, and so I, I thank the Lord for the way that He has provided for our Calvary Hill family uh, during uh, these days. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm also thankful uh, for the way that uh, our nation has responded. Uh, I, I know that many of us in this church are going to be the beneficiaries of certain aspects of the CARES Act. Uh, and, and so if you are struggling financially, we are hopeful that this is going to soon help ease the burden of those who perhaps lost their jobs or that their hours have been cut back as a result of the sheltering in place guidelines. So I'm thankful uh, for all of these things, God's protection, God's provision. But most of all, uh, and this has been the greatest thing during these, these weeks uh, of sheltering in place, I'm thankful for you. Thankful for the people of God. I'm thankful for your phone calls and your visits. You don't know how many times over the years people have thanked us for our phone calls and visits during times of difficulty that they went through. Uh, but during this time of difficulty, Again, uh, as Neil said a minute ago, we're living in a day when nobody really knows what's going on. Nobody really knows what to do. Let me tell you, that starts right here. It's been difficult for us to know from week to week what we should do, what we shouldn't do, how we should respond. Uh, but you have made that so much easier for us uh, by your words of encouragement. Let me thank you for your financial faithfulness. Uh, and not only are people sending their tithe checks and delivering them, but uh, we are receiving notes uh, along with those tithes and offerings. Let me, let me just share with you kind of a serious note, and again, a, a note that inspired my heart. Uh, a tithe check arrived, and on the outside of the envelope was this note. Pray for me. This is my last paycheck. Someone who knew, someone a who's a part of this church, who knew that they would not receive another paycheck, at least for a period of time, tithed on their last paycheck in spite of that knowledge. I, I am so thankful for people with that kind of faithfulness to the Lord. Uh, we also received uh, a tithe check with a little less serious note. Uh, this note claimed to be an ad that was found in the newspaper, and it read like this, single man with toilet paper looking for a single lady with hand sanitizer. Uh, it's good to keep a sense of humor during days like this. 
Uh, and obviously, some of you are managing to do that and sharing it with us. I also want to thank you for the kind and encouraging words that we have heard over these days. I mean, numerous stories I could share with you this morning, but one after another, and, and I'm telling you, it, it almost caught me off guard in the beginning, how quickly people began to share with us how much they missed our gathering together. Uh, I, I'm so thankful for that, so thankful that you want to be here, so thankful that you want to gather for worship each Sunday morning. Uh, I stood outside of the church just last week uh, and listened to one of our young men get choked up as he talked about the difficulty of not being together in church each morning or each week. Uh, I, I mean, he had to stop in the middle of his story to keep from tearing up. Uh, such an encouragement to me. So for these reasons and for so many more that we could list today, we are thankful, thankful for what God is doing during these difficult days, thankful for what you are doing during these difficult days. As both Rick and Neil have said, we love you and we miss you and we are so eager uh, to be able to gather together again with you right here in this place, to meet in our Sunday school classes, uh, to gather on Wednesday nights, uh, to share around God's word, to sing, uh, to laugh, to pray, together. We're, we're looking forward to that as I know you are. So as uh, we close this morning, let me just pray with you one last time today uh, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we thank you for your presence, uh, that constant source of encouragement, that constant source of power and peace uh, that constant source of assurance that we do not have to be afraid. We do not have to be troubled. Uh, we do not have to be anxious. Uh, we have a Heavenly Father who loves us more than we can even imagine. A God who hears and responds to the cries of His people. A God who cares and tells us that we should cast all of our care upon Him. We thank You for being that God. Now, Lord, I pray that you would help us as your children to walk in light of the great truths that you have revealed to us. Help us, Father, to joyfully live during these days of difficulty and to continue in the mission that you have set with us to carry the message of the gospel into all the world. Give us the strength, the power, uh, an eagerness and a joy to walk in obedience to you during these days. And we pray all of these things now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you. God bless you.